see those people right here, okay? And one's from a gentleman and one's from a lady. It says, here's from a, here's from a gentleman. He writes, of all the girls that I ever knew, I never saw one I thought would do. I wanted a wife that was nice and neat, that up to date and had small feet. <laughs> I wanted a wife that was loving and kind, and that had too much an independent mind. I wanted a wife that could cook and sew and wasn't internally on the go. I wanted a wife that was strikingly beautiful, intelligent, rich, and exceedingly dutiful. That isn't so much to demand in a wife, but she's still not found who I've looked all my life. <laughs> right? I don't know if you guys know any gentlemen like that. Maybe their standards are a bit too high and they never find that lady. And here's, here's from a young lady. The only reason why I've never wed is as clear as the day as easily said. Two lovers I had who have, who'd have made me a bride, but the trouble was just that I couldn't decide. Whenever John came, I was sure it was he that I cared for the most. But with Charlie by me, my hands clasped in his, in his and his eyes fixed on mine. T'was as easy as could be to say, I'll be thine. Now tell me, what was a poor maiden to do who couldn't to save her make choice between these two? I dillied and dallied and couldn't decide till Johnny got married and Charlie, he died. <laughs> and that is the reason why I've never wed. For how could I help it, as everyone said, when Johnny was married and Charlie was dead? Right? So those are, uh, that, those poems kind of set the setting for this passage we're about to preach here today, okay? And uh, we're going to see these things about singleness and marriedness and every, some people all confused in between, all right? Now, I've got a few verses before I introduce seven. It, is, it says in Ecclesiastes 4.12 that if one can overpower him who is alone, two can resist him. A cord of three strands is not quickly torn apart. So marriage is a beautiful thing indeed. And even if someone is not gifted with the gift of marriage and they've been gifted with the gift of singleness, it doesn't mean they can't find somebody else in life that they can be a good friend with, a good comrade with, and really be connected with. You know, I, I really believe there's a, there's a book I read recently by Larry Kraft called Connection. He said, the best medicine any one of us could ever have is connecting with one another. And he said, he's a psychotherapist, psychiatrist type of guy, gives out medicine, professional, doctor, PhD fellow. And he said, in all of his time, and he's been that way for a long time, Larry Kraft has been a while, been around a while, he said the best thing he's ever seen is when people can connect with one another for good healthiness on the inside. And I tell you, the church should be the best place to do that for sure. And I hope you guys continue to connect. I love to see you guys connect. It's a good thing when Lou has to try to get everybody rallied in and because uh, everybody wants to connect and talk with one another. It's beautiful. Imagine how miserable it would be if everybody just came here and sat down. Right. Nobody yeah. said anything. Everybody went like this. It would be kind of sad. It's good that we're connecting. And we need to continue to connect. But that's what this verse shows. And the marriage is a very solid connection. And we can also, if we're not married, be connected with others as well. And even if we're married, we be connected with others as well. But it won't be as close as the marriage relationship. And, uh, and I wrote, the best thing I ever did in my life was to marry my wife. Okay, that's the best decision I made. So, we, so that's the best choice I ever made, best thing. She's my, she's my first and best neighbor by far, for sure. And I, I think that everybody's wife or husband should be their first and best neighbor, should mean the world to them above everybody else is that person. First is Jesus, and then is your neighbor. Who's your neighbor? Your first neighbor is your spouse, your significant other. That's your first neighbor. And I tell you, some of us that have been gifted with marriage, if we didn't follow through with that and we maybe held off like maybe some of these folks did, <laughs> it would be a lot harder on us, okay? <coughs> Others people, you know, maybe it is better they're single right there, but it's wherever God has gifted you and put you, and we need to, to realize that God is big and His destiny for us is fulfilled, okay? If we were all bound to find our own destiny, and we probably, most of us would miss the mark, okay? We would miss it. But God's big and God controls these things and He leads us to our destiny. So we don't have to 
be all stressed out and always be like, where is my destiny? And then we think, oh, I lost the whole thing. Well, you were in your destiny. The Lord had you where he wanted you, okay? Amen. So here in Colossians 3, 2, it says, set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. So if we put God first and we keep this eternal mind going all the time, everything else is going to work itself out, okay? We shouldn't get so worried and frazzled about the little things. All right, and I wrote, spirituality is based on obedience to God. All right, we can't say we're spiritual and not even think about God or go toward God at all. Okay, spirituality is based on obedience to God. Every single person is spiritual. I deal with a lot of folks, and I'm a chaplain. Chaplains are supposed to, you know, be spiritual caretakers and things. And I tell you, every single person has a spirit. There's nobody that's like born without a spirit. They wouldn't be alive. They'd be, they'd be. They'd be dead. They wouldn't be living flesh. Every single living person has a spirit, but the difference is, are you alive in God, or are you dead to God and, and just not alive to Him? We've all got a spirit, but if we're able to set that spirit on the things of God, we will grow and grow and grow and continue to grow. If we keep it on the things of this world, if we got, we can see what we got. We got the best that you got is what you see, and there's not a whole lot more than that. But the things of God is, is the way to keep our minds set on. Amen. Now we'll start the passage. It says, Now concerning virgins, I have no command of the Lord, but I give an opinion as one who by the mercy of the Lord is trustworthy. Now I looked at some things, and I listened to some other sermons and things, and one fellow pointed out that 25 years ago, you weren't even allowed to say the word virgin on public TV. Because it has something to do with, uh, you know, being physical and stuff. So they weren't even allowed to say that. We've come a long way since then. And here we are in church. We're reading the Word of the Lord. And the Word of the Lord has not changed. I don't know what it was like back then when they said these things. But, uh, but it doesn't always mean here when it says virgins. It doesn't have to only mean like a, a, a virgin. It could mean a young woman who is divorced and single now. Okay? And it says here, he says he gives an opinion as one who by the mercy of the Lord is trustworthy. Some people will take this as this was just Paul's idea and they can just throw it out. But I think that is very wrong. Paul was an apostle of Jesus Christ. All right, Paul was gifted with this office of apostleship. Apostles aren't around every day. Okay, I don't know any apostles around today. I know a lot who say they're around. I told you the story before. I ordered a communion tray once and it had a dent in it. And I called back Amazon, and they connected me directly with the guy I bought it from. And he told me, there was no dent in there. I am an apostle. And I said, all right, okay. And I said, well, I'm a pastor. <laughs> and there was a dent when it showed up. But I don't believe apostles are around today. But apostles were around back then, and apostles were the mouthpiece of God on the earth. And Paul was a mouthpiece of God on the earth. What Paul spoke was the words of the Lord, all right? So several times in this chapter alone, you'll see that Paul differentiates and says that it's not what the Lord said, but it's what I say, because Jesus didn't directly say any of this stuff. But Paul is the one who's saying this stuff through the Holy Spirit to us. Just because Jesus didn't talk about everything doesn't mean that Jesus didn't have words for us through Paul to listen to and to let speak into our lives, all right? Paul's advice was God's advice. This wasn't just Paul. We can't just throw this chapter out. This is the advice of God to us. It says, I think that then I think then that this is a good in view of the present distress, that it is good for a man to remain as he is. Now there was a lot of trouble going on then. Remember the early early century Christianity was flourishing. The church was already thousands strong. This isn't even in Jerusalem, Corinthians. You know, the town of Corinth wasn't even there. And persecution was coming. It would still be about 15 more years until the severe persecution under Nero would come. But it was coming. And I read about some things that Nero did to Christians, and it was horrible. So horrible, I don't even want to mention it to you guys. You may get nightmares or something. But if you want to ask me about it later, you can ask me. Or you can search up the things that he did to Christians. But it was, it was worse than you could imagine. It wasn't just some quick death. He had slow, painful, torturous deaths to Christians. That was in an awful type of way. So he knew that the time was coming for a lot of trouble. And, uh, and when the trouble comes, 
it's much harder to go through extreme trouble and suffering as a married person than it is as a single person. If your family, if all of a sudden we had all kinds of persecution coming and they were dragging out Christians from their houses and killing them and torturing them and doing terrible things, it would be much harder to be with your family and be concerned for your wife and your children and try to keep them all safe as much as you can when the persecution is coming to everyone. And that's the type of way it was. I tell you, in America, we don't know persecution whatsoever yet, at all. And yet, if you look at the rest of the world, the rest of the world, we have had more people killed in the name of Christ in the last century than all 20 centuries combined together. And it's something that sounds foreign to us because we don't even see it. We're not in a nation where Christians are being murdered and killed and tortured. But other nations, they are. Other nations, if you're found with a Bible, you just signed your death warrant. And it's a big deal. And it's still going on all over the world. And yet, it's not going on here yet at all. You know, we think things are getting bad here. Things have been way worse in other parts of the world. And perhaps they're coming this way as well. All right, we can't think that we'll be sheltered for long with all the madness that we have going on, all the abortions we have going on, all the 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 uh, the, the things that are wrong and evil in the sight of the Lord, that what courts are saying that this is right and all kinds of things like this. Eventually, things are going to fall upon us as well, and it won't be easy. But we don't know the day, but I tell you, every one of these guys that was in the Bible time, Paul and the rest of them, they believed Jesus was coming back in their lifetime. They believed Jesus was going to return any single day. And they knew what Jesus had said, that in the last days, there's going to be all <coughs> kinds of trouble. Okay, The world is never going to get better. The world is going toward destruction. All right, I hear a lot of people in the world say all the time, well, if we did this and we did that, things would be better. Well, they may be. But we know from the words of God that they won't be. Okay, We know that no matter what, things are going to be destroyed. It's just like my favorite book, The Pilgrim's Progress. He realizes as he reads the Bible that these things are true in the Bible. And he says, I must flee from this city of destruction. For wrath and the fire of God is about to fall upon us. And it surely will one day on this world. We're not, gonna, we're not going to uh, achieve... Uh, a great place on this world on this side of heaven. But Jesus is going to come and fix everything, and we will live on the earth for a thousand years, but it's not going to be achieved from our own polit political things or different stuff. doesn't mean that we shouldn't strive for the better. Every day we should strive for the better. But yet at the same time, we need to be realistic, read the Word of God, and believe it, because it says what it says, and it's going to happen. And they held it that way, and they believed it that way. So yet another reason why this passage is written to stay as you are, stay single, or stay married, because the trouble is coming, and it's going to be hard for those that are married. All right? And married people have no choice. You know, once they're married, they're married. Single people do. They can get married, or they can remain single. And uh, for some people, that's a wonderful thing. For some people, that's a very hard thing to stay married. I know from uh, searching out wedding things and doing some premarital counseling and things that most people who are unhappily married, if they stick it out for five years, will find themselves happily married in five years. Times come up, times go down. We need to keep on keeping on and follow that way. All right? So it says, but if you marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. Yet such will have trouble in this life. And I'm trying to spare you. I know before I got married, and I think before every man gets married, some people tell him, oh no, what are you doing? This is going to be trouble. Don't do it. Don't do it. I tell you, maybe you guys don't relate. Maybe you do it. You're afraid to say anything because your spouse is here. But this is what everybody says. And for sure, there really is trouble. When you get married, you run into trouble. And it's because... We're all sinners. Every single person is a sinner. And when you get married, not only are you your own sinner, but you're now you're with another sinner. All right? And you're in a very close relationship with this other sinner. And it's going to multiply and intensify the troubles. Okay? This is what goes on. All right? No one is sinless. 
when people have kids, now they've got little sinners in the house as well, right? And, and it is. It's just going to, all this sin problem is hard to deal with, all right? It gives us trouble. And no matter how much we love the Lord and we follow the Lord, if we say we're not a sinner, it says in the Bible that we're a liar and the truth of God is not in us. It says that in 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. Now, there's a difference between a saintly sinner, you know, a sinning saint, and a, and a, and a sinner without the saint adjective around there, okay? There's a difference between that for sure. But we're never going to be able to completely rid the flesh. I, I wasn't here for Thursday night, but you guys were studying Romans 7, and it points out in Romans 7 that Paul, as far along as he was in his Christian walk, you know, 25, 30 years as an apostle, still did the things he hated to do, still was having trouble and fighting sin on a daily basis, all right? And he was an apostle, okay? I don't think I'll ever achieve the, the biblical wisdom, knowledge, and place where Paul was in my lifetime. And yet Paul was there. Paul wrote half of the New Testament, and he still struggled with sin. So none of us can lie to ourselves and say that we're not sinners. And if you're in a married relationship, you can know that you can just ask your wife... And she'll let you know you're a sinner, okay? She'll tell you right away. It won't, it won't, won't hide it from you, right? And that's what goes on. No one is sinless, all right? No one. So that's why I'm saying there's going to be trouble in this life when you get married, okay? Because now you're not only dealing with your own sinful problem, you've got somebody else very close to you with their sinful problem, all right? Here are some things. Some of these are all man sins that I can think about, okay? The okay? sin of forgetfulness. All right? How many of us men have the sin of forgetfulness? I know I do, okay? My wife reminds me. I bet some of you guys, your wife reminds you too. All right? The sin of thoughtlessness, that you're not thoughtful enough, okay? This happens too. And we try to be thoughtful. I, I do in all my marital uh, type things. I try, to, I try to point out to people that probably one word that would sum up all of a good marriage would be thoughtfulness. But yet we know we're going to have at times thoughtlessness because in order, if we're going to strive to thoughtfulness, we know that sometimes we're going to be thoughtlessness, right? And we're working on that. We're trying to do those things. Sin of pride, okay? How many men, we've got, we got pride built into us. You know, pride's one of those sins, like they say with alcoholism, they say the, the first sign is denial. Every single person that applies to with pride. If we say, I don't have any pride, we're in denial, okay? We are. We may not have as much pride as the next guy has, or as much pride as we used to have, or we may have more, who knows? But we're in denial if we say we don't have that. Self-centeredness. We're all focused on, on uh, you know, self-centeredness too much right there. When we're married, we got to be focused on the other person, and I really think marriage helps us to be less selfish. Day by day, we learn and we grow. we got to keep going that way. And... We have to deal with other people's sin. That's part of marriage, okay? We can't run away from it. They can't hide it because you're in that close relationship, and it's going to come up. I wrote, marriage is ordained by God, okay? It's good, it's holy, and it's fulfilling. So we're not saying bad things about marriage, but it does not solve all problems. It brings more problems, all right? This is reality. Marriage will bring more problems. Some people get married and they think everything's going to be fine from here on out because I got married. But that would be like saying they're going to wipe out all my sin and fix me and I'll be perfect. And that's not possible, okay? That's too much to put on anybody. Nobody can fix somebody else and make them perfect. Jesus can fix us and make us perfect. And even as Jesus does this, it takes a lifetime of sanctification and growth as we continue to grow that way. It doesn't you know, it doesn't, doesn't happen immediately. I've never seen a man that was saved and then never sinned again. And I don't think it's possible because I have Bible verse like 1 John 1, 8 that says you're a liar if you say that you're not a sinner. And says so the truth of God isn't even in you, all right? Marriage should never be used as a means of escape, even from loneliness. There's people that get married because they just don't want to be lonely, and they are lonely in a marriage afterwards, okay? It doesn't just go away. Uh, if there's... I wrote, sin is not corrected by marriage. Now, I misspelled some words here, sorry. Now the other person is now afflicted by your sin as well. So not only have you gone into a marriage if you thought things were all going to be great and all disappear and you're going to have a wonderful life, now the other person is afflicted by the same things you were afflicted by before. And you share those afflictions together. And there are troubles in singleness 
but they may be exceeded by the troubles of marriage because it's not just your troubles, now you're dealing with someone else's troubles at the same time. Uh, I wrote, marriage does not prevent great devotion to the Lord, and singleness does not guarantee it. I think that's a, a, good, a good thing to say right there. It doesn't mean that because you're married, you can't have great devotion to God, but it doesn't also mean that if you stay single, that, that you're guaranteed great devotion to God, okay? I know myself, I am much closer to God because I am married, okay? I know my wife has done great things with me and helped me along the way, and if I hadn't met her in life and married her, I might not be where I am today for sure, okay? So I, you know, I, I look at it as a gift of marriage, and yes, some people are gifted with singleness as well, okay? So, so we, can't, we can't say you have to have one or you have to have the other, but for sure, wherever, if you're in a marriage today, the right answer is you stay in that marriage, okay? And it's all about today. It's not about yesterday. It's not about what happened before. You can't do anything about that stuff. We've got to let all that past stuff always go because there's nothing we can do with the past. We can only deal with today. So don't dwell in the past. Deal with today. Live in today and look to tomorrow. All right, if we look here, it says in 7, 29 to 31, it says, But this I say, brethren, the time has been shortened, so that from now on those who have wives should be as though they had none. Now this is probably talking about some early prophecy too, which was about to happen, because within 15 years, like I said, Nero would come and, and millions would die. And it says, if you've ever read this book, it's a really good book to read, you know, it's old book, so it's a little bit hard to read, but it's a good one, it's called The Fox's Book of Martyrs, and all it does is talk about people who have given their life for Christ, and the, one of the first martyrs in that book is a guy named Erastus, who was the treasurer of the city of Corinth, so it came very close and personal to Corinth right away, Corinth wasn't excluded from the, from, the, from the purging of Rome from Nero that went out to all these other places as well. So it did come very close to them, and he warns them, and he tells them that, you know, that the time is coming soon, the time is short, and there's great trouble coming. All right? If you read the, if you read the Bible, like I think it's Matthew 25, it says that pray, Jesus said pray that when the end comes, that it won't be in the winter time. Because you're going to have to run to the mountains and run in the snow. And, and how hard it will be for those who have wives and those who have children. And I tell you, I personally can relate to that when I read that. Because I was in special forces. I was in a cold weather winter warfare group where we would go all the time for like six weeks. In the tops of mountains up at 10,000 foot elevation. 10 feet deep of snow. And just have to live with what was on our back and be tactical at the same time so we couldn't have big fires or anything like that to stay warm and it was tremendously painful and I could just imagine when the end comes if it comes during the snow time like that and people are having to flee and take to the hills and to the woods and to the mountains it's going to be very hard you know we were highly skilled and trained and even had the right gear to just run with what you got to the hills whoa it's going to be hard all right but you know what I got hope when I read that chapter because Jesus says pray Pray that it might not be there. So maybe it won't be during the winter time because Jesus said, pray. You know, pray that make sure this doesn't happen at this time. All right? It says the next verse, And those who weep as though they did not weep. And those who rejoice as though they did not rejoice. And those who buy as though they did not possess. Now this sounds like some kind of confusing poetry here. And you're like, what does that really mean? What does this mean when you're looking at this? And i tell you what I think it means. And from the stuff I looked at, is it means that love is, is, is emotions and perspective in proportion. Okay? We can't let our emotions run away with us that that's all it is. And a good example of that would be we all know people who maybe have lost a loved one or something, or lost a wife or a husband, and they never get past it. And they stay there in their grief, and they don't move any further. Okay? And this is not a good thing, okay? You're basically, there's a time to grieve, and it could take years for someone to grieve, but if that person never gets out of their grief, they're really having a loss of the hope they have in Jesus Christ, okay? We have hope in Jesus Christ that exceeds the hope we have in our spouse, that exceeds the hope of anything this earth can ever give. We've got it in Jesus Christ. So we need to keep Him in focus. Now, 
Do you tell someone who's grieving and they just lost their spouse this verse and try to explain that to them? I would say no. You give them time. You be like a be like Job's friends before they turned bad to Job and they sat with him for seven days. And they should have sat with him a lot longer than that. But eventually, one day comes along and it's been a year or years or sometimes it's excessively farther along and the person is going worse and worse and damage is actually happening to the person during their grief. You may have to help them get that hope of Christ back in them. You know, let them know how much does Jesus mean to you. Is Jesus bigger than this problem? Is Jesus bigger than this grief that you're going through? And we've got to be able to get that hope in and hold on to it and not let it go, okay? We've got to be able to go from weeping to not weeping. You know, from times of rejoicing to times of not rejoicing. We've got to be able to move and we've got to be able to stay centered on Christ, okay? It's like they always say in the world, don't put all your eggs in one basket. If you have all your eggs in one basket and that's your spouse and your spouse is gone, what's going to happen to you after that, okay? And what did Jesus say? He even said, and when he was on the earth, he said, unless you hate your father, your mother, your sister, your brother, your wife, even everyone, and take up my cross and follow me, you'll have no part in me, okay? And that doesn't mean that you actually hate them, but in comparison to the love that we have for Christ, it's got to be bigger, the love we have for Christ, okay? And it's going to be tough at times, but this is an important point for us to understand and realize that we have got hope in Christ that surpasses all other hope everywhere. All right? And that's a hard way. It says, And those who use the world as though they did not make full use of it, for the form of this world is passing away. Everything is going to pass away in this world. There is nothing that's going to stay. Jesus said in Matthew 22, 30 very clearly that marriage will pass away. All right? So any pastor or someone that marries someone and says this is an eternal marriage, they've messed up. They should not have said eternal. Till death do them part is what we say in marriage because there is no marriage in heaven. All right, Jesus was very clear on that. Now there's a lot of cults that teach otherwise. Mormons teach that we'll be married in heaven. All right, That's not what Jesus said. Matthew 22, 30 is very clear. There is no marriage in heaven. In fact, if you go to that passage... It's where the Sadducees, remember, you remember those guys because they're Sadducee, because they don't believe in any afterlife. They don't believe in the resurrection. And they were trying to catch up Jesus, because probably one of their regular arguments was, if a guy gets married, and, uh, and there's seven brothers, and the one wife of the guy, you know, that guy dies, then the next brother marries that woman, then the next brother marries that woman, that was a Jewish custom there, kinsman, redeemer. And at the end of the day, when they go to heaven, whose wife is she? And that's what they asked him because they were trying to catch him and they were trying to take worldly wisdom and push it on Jesus as if it's going to catch him up. And Jesus said, you know what? There is no marriage in heaven. We're all going to be like the angels are when we go to heaven. There won't be any marriage in heaven. So marriage will pass away as well. So when cults or someone teach otherwise, you just have to look at the Word of God and be like, you may say that, but my Bible says this and this is what I'm going to believe, the Word of God not something that's that's flimsy over there, okay? So everything's going to pass away one day. So what does that leave us with? One rock and one hope, and that's Jesus Christ. If we don't have that one rock and one hope, where are we at? We're going to be just like the storm that came and blew us away, and we had nothing to stand on. But if we're standing on that rock, everything's good. Marriage is good. Singleness is good. Whatever can be good, because nothing can sway us. Because nobody can take Jesus Christ away from us. Nobody can take us away. Okay, all those classes, Book of Martyrs, they couldn't take Jesus away. The Stephen the Martyr couldn't take Jesus away from Stephen the Martyr. When you're on that rock, nothing can take it away. doesn't mean you won't feel horrible. doesn't mean you won't have emotions up and down in all different ways and things. But you can know at the end of the day, you're standing on the solid rock of Christ. Here in the next verse... I added one in here. Didn't make it myself. I took it from another part of Scripture. It says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Man, that's a hard one right there. And that's what it says in 1 John 2.15. That if we love this world more than we love God, then, then we don't know God. All right, That really can hit home with us right here. But you know it's a good sign if it does hit home with you. That's a good sign. For people it doesn't hit home with, 
That's the worst sign right there. Because the good sign is we're all going to get stabbed as we read the Word of God. All right? We're all going to feel the fallen human condition as we read the Word of God. And that's a good thing because it's like the way surgeons say to cut is to heal. It's like God is like <laughs> stabbing us a little bit, but in such a way that we're going to heal and grow and be better. So you'll feel pain when you read verses like this. And if you feel that pain, that's a good thing. Because if you feel like you love the world more than you love God, and you feel some pain about it, it should cause you to change and turn and follow after Christ a little bit more. And I tell you what, every one of us can follow Christ a little bit more. Because we all are growing, and if we say we've already achieved it, then it's just like we're teenagers, some teenagers, not saying all teenagers, but maybe at one point will think that they know everything, all right? And think they've achieved this level of knowledge of everything, and before long we realize, oh boy, there's a whole lot I don't know yet, okay? And that's the way it is. As we grow in God and we grow in the Word, I tell you, I feel more convicted each day as I read the Word, and I feel more drawn to God. When I, when I see my Bible, or I even like this hymn book so much, I think, oh, what a blessed thing it is that I have some kind of anchor, some kind of tether to some kind of bit of truth that I can hold on to that can help me in my life and something I can trust and that can change me and do good for me, all right? It may not always feel good to me, but it's something that does good for me, all right? And that's what the Word and that's what Jesus does for us. First John 2, 16 and 17, to continue that verse says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. Okay, those are things that God doesn't give you to, to enhance your life right there. He doesn't enhance you with temptation and with pride and with those feelings of the flesh that would go wrong, maybe anger and rage or you know, misguided things, those aren't things that are from God. Those are things that exist in this cursed and broken and sinful world that we live within. And we don't want to grab onto the bad stuff. We want to grab onto the good stuff. And many of us aren't too attached to the material world. In fact, the more I grow in Christ, the more I realize I'm too attached. And I always have to keep trying to unattach myself a little bit more. And I think that's the way it is for many of us. And then the end of this passage for 1 John says, The world is passing away, just like Corinthians said, everything's passing away. And also it's lust, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. Amen. So when we're following after the Lord, we're going to live forever. <coughs> everything else is going to pass away, and we're still going to be standing on that rock. All right? And we're going to be in good shape. And we must understand the priority of the eternal over the temporal. If we can try to picture life and think about eternity and not just think about the right here and right now, everything is a lot better. And I tell you what, I am a firm believer that that's how we can really have the peace of God that passes all understanding is we know what's going to happen in the end. So it doesn't matter as much what happens between now and then because at the end of the day, we know everything's going to be okay. Amen. All right? If we didn't have that assurance, man, I don't know what I would do. I don't know how I would have any joy. I don't know how when... People say you can't have assurance that you're going to enter the kingdom of heaven or you can't have assurance or know where you're going to go or what's going to happen. I, it just takes the hope right out of it. It zaps the hope away. And I don't believe any of that because the Word of God says that those who believe in Him are saved. That those who believe in Jesus are secure. That no one can take them out of His hands. And I take no one also to mean that person themselves cannot take them out of His hand. All right? So if we keep our hope on the eternal and not the temporal, everything's always going to be okay. Not that we're not going to feel pain, great grief, great emotion like this, but if we keep our eyes focused on the eternal, everything starts to have a whole different look about it. You know, it's like you're putting on your sunglasses that are red shades, and everything looks red. You put on the green ones, everything looks green. Or you can put on your good theological sunglasses of the Word of God, and everything will be clear or clearer, and you can see so much better, okay? It won't be tainted. It says, but I want you to be free from concern. The one who is unmarried is concerned about the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord, all right? For those who are gifted with singleness, and those who aren't, they're burning with passion, hoping they go get married or something, hoping they find the person of their life, all kinds of different things. But for those gifted with singleness, because Paul was gifted with singleness, he likely was married before they say, they say, 
part of being part of the Sanhedrin was you we had to be married. So we don't know what happened to Paul's wife. She died, whatnot. We don't know. But yet he points this out that if you're unmarried, you can totally focus on God and not worry about somebody else. Okay, they only have one world to focus on. But he says, but to the one who is married is concerned about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. And I wrote, and so it should be. You know, it should be that a man should want to please his wife and do good by her and help her and, and be the man that he should be. But this now gives him an extra handful of, of, of life, an extra handful of work to do. Because now he is now trying to please the Lord and he needs to be pleasing his wife as well. All right, And for sure you should be pleasing your wife. If you take this sermon and go home like, that's it, I'm doing whatever I want to do from now on, pleasing God, and I'm walking away from you, woman, and doing my own thing, you're in sin, okay? Don't take that as what I mean, all right? I don't mean that a bit. I'm saying a man that has more work when he's married, a woman has more work with her husband when she's married, she's got that sin of forgetfulness that their husband's always going to be having troubles with. That's going to be something you have to deal with and you have to balance, but that's the way it's supposed to be in marriage. And his interests are divided. The woman who is unmarried and the virgin is concerned about the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and spirit. But one who is married is concerned about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. And I wrote, and so it should be, that the woman is concerned how she pleases her husband. It's a beautiful thing, all right? If both people are concerned about how to please one another, that's a good marriage right there, okay? And at times... It's not always going to be that way. We're all going to have our ups and downs. We're going to falter. We're human beings. But at the end of the day, in a good marriage, we want to try to please one another. Okay? And that's what we should be doing. But if anyone does not provide for his own, this is the verse outside the passage, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. And if you look at King James, worse than an infidel. Is what the King James Version says here. All right? Infidel is the big word over there in the Muslim countries that they call us now. And a lot of our soldiers, for funny jokes, get little patches that says infidel on the side of their uniforms while they're over there in combat. But, but this is something here is we have got to provide for our family. If we don't provide for our family, if we don't care for our family, it says we are worse than an unbeliever. So it's important that we do provide for our families. We must not neglect our families. This is of essential importance. And I tell you, as I'm doing, I've got a bunch of papers, and my mind's been buzzing all over the place lately trying to get these papers done. Tomorrow they need to be turned in, so I'll be free, I surely hope. I'll be working like 20 hours probably not to finish them all still, but I'll be free. But a lot of this stuff I've been studying is about psychology and how much your family affects you. And I tell you what, if you don't have things right with your family, you need to try to figure them out, okay, and make things the best that they possibly can be, because it will affect you and continue to affect you. It's not something you can turn away from and just be like, whatever that part of my family, we have got to face those things and work on them and at least be aware of them. Being aware is the majority of the battle. And I'll tell you, when I found that out, as I looked at these things, I thought, oh, isn't that nice? I don't have to really fix anything. I just have to be very aware of things. I have to be aware, and I have to be able to see things for what they are. And that helps you. And that's part of this verse right here. It says that we need to love our families we need to take care of them. Otherwise, we're worse than an unbeliever. And I'll tell you, all sin has consequence. God never gifted us with any sin. Okay, sin doesn't come from God. Sin is a bad thing, and it holds bad consequences. And even if we're a believer, if we fall into sin, we're going to feel the pain and the consequence. And it will be with us for quite some time if we're not careful. It says, This I say for your own benefit, not to put a restraint upon you, but to promote what is appropriate and to secure undistracted devotion to the Lord. All right, so he's telling us all these things about marriage and singleness because the most important thing is is that we have an undistracted devotion to God. And I'll tell you, once again with marital counseling and uh, marital uh, studies and books that I read and search out, is the biggest problem that usually goes on in marriages is we lose focus of Jesus Christ. We start to focus on our problems. We start to focus on the other person's issues. It's always easiest for us to see somebody else's issues before we see our own. Okay? Anybody can do that, you know. 
It's like the old Ray Comfort thing. Somebody says, well, you're a liar. Because I'm not a liar. Well, what would you call him if he told a lie? I call him a liar is what I call him. Well, we can look at ourselves the same way as well. Okay? But it's easier for us to look at somebody else and judge them. But, but here is the thing is, is we have got to have undistracted devotion to God. We've got to have our quiet time with the Lord. We've got to have time that we spend in the Word. We have to time, have time we spend in prayer with God. Or we are going to get so off kilter and be terrible. I can think of like a top. You know, I don't know if you remember when you were a little kid, they had tops. I think me and my little kids had tops. And you spin that top and it circles and it goes all around the top of the table. And eventually it kind of keters and it falls over. All right. We're like a top as long as we're, we're spinning as long as we're devoted to God. But the moment we quit being devoted to God, we're going to start falling over, bouncing off the table. Falling down the stairs, I don't know, go down into the street, river of uh, sewage, or wash us away into a lake, an alligator will eat us, I don't know. Crazy things will go on when we lose our devotion to God, okay? And you know what's so beautiful about God is His grace is so big, and He is so big, and His love is so tremendous, that no matter how far off your kilter has fallen, and no matter how far down the sewage, even if you're in the alligator's belly, even if the alligator already got rid of you and you're in a pile somewhere, you can still turn around and devote yourself to the Lord wherever you are at any point in your life, in your marriage, in wherever you are. And that's such a beautiful thing of living in the present. We don't live in the past. We live in the present. We live here today. And God's love is present with us today. Amen. All right? It hasn't left us. It's here just as much today as it was before. <coughs> it's right here. So we can devote ourselves to God. And I put here too, as we'll see as this passage continues on, it's not necessarily always between right and wrong, but it's between good and better is what it's between. Okay, It's not trying to say that we're all doing some horrible thing here and could do some great thing. It's saying maybe we're doing a good thing here, but we could do something better over here. All right, And really it's about putting God first. If we put God first, we're much more likely to be able to do the better thing. All right, I tell you, in all this psychology mode, I'm sorry, I hope I haven't overloaded you today with these things. It has overloaded me indeed. But for human beings, we are such routine creatures. We're routine. We always we get the beaten path and we feel comfortable with it and we're always right there. For us to change requires us to be uncomfortable to go out of our circle of the norm to do something different. Mm -hmm. And then we have to, and then we feel some pain when we go out the norm. We feel some pushback, some pressure. And we've got to keep pressing on past that until now we have another new norm and a new routine. And that's how we grow in life. And we got to keep pressing and go that way. And when God is first in our life, I tell you what, that growth is going to change so much more for us than if you were just to tell that to somebody who didn't believe in the Lord and is just trying to follow some principles. They'll get a little bit of change too, but they're not going to get it like those who put their faith in God and have a God that can do the impossible, that can do all things, and that can help us through those paths of pushing out from where we were before. But if any man thinks that he is acting unbecomingly toward his virgin, daughter, if she has passed her youth, and if it must be so, let him do what he wishes, and he does not sin, let her marry. Now this was probably a great verse for those Corinthians who some of the men in the church were trying to be so holy and devoted that they decided their daughter would never marry. Now that poor daughter probably didn't feel so good in that situation. If she wanted to marry somebody, she had eyes for some man in the church, or eyes for some man she knew somewhere, and she wanted to get married. And the dad's like, you know what, I made a devotion to God. You'll never get married. <laughs> You're devoted to God forever. It says here, don't let that be. That if she wants to marry, let her marry. All right, so there, so it shouldn't be like that. And like I said when I started this, that that's something that, that we won't understand unless we realize those days. But that was the way it was back then. If the dad didn't say they were marrying, they weren't marrying. And that was, that was a hard way. And I've read you before about 1 Timothy where it talks about in the end times how false religions will tell people they can't marry and they're not allowed to marry and they'll make all these rules with those things. And uh, it's never right if... We don't know who God is gifted to marry and who he's gifted to be single. Leave that up to that person, okay? Don't put your push on somebody else, whether they're to be married or whether they're to be single. It's that person's decision, and let them follow it, okay? 
And some fathers were trying to take it away from their daughters and say, this is the way you're going to be. And that poor daughter was a girl that should be married, and she wasn't able to be. And it goes on and talks about it for a few more verses. It says, but he who stands firm in his heart, <coughs> being under no constraint, but has authority over his own will, and has decided this in his own heart to keep his own virgin daughter, he will do well. So, you know, hopefully he's done that in accordance with his virgin daughter, with his single daughter's uh, giftedness, and, and he's not pressing his own things upon his single daughter, okay? It's something that they're coming to the conclusion to together. So then both, he who gives his own virgin daughter in marriage does well, and he who does not give her in marriage will do better. So it says it's okay, you will do well if you give your daughter away to be married, and if your daughter wants to get married, it's okay. And you may think, why is it better? Well, I think we can go back to the principle that, you know, when we marry, it's not just one sinner. There's two sinners. There's more sin combined. There's more misery. His daughter's going to have some more issues sometimes, and he's going to have to deal with it, all right? He's going to have to maybe help support him sometimes or, or be there emotionally or whatever it is for him. A wife is bound as long as her husband lives, but if her husband is dead, she is free to be married to whom she wishes only in the Lord. Now, this is what I wrote on the top here. There's no Mr. Rights, ladies. Because <laughs> if there were, look at how this verse words right here. It says, it says, she's free to be married to whom she wishes. Okay? And, you know, another version of whomsoever she wishes. That means she can pick, she can choose who she can be married to. If there's only one Mr. Right, it would be like she can be married to the one man that the Lord sends along. No. She can be married to whoever she wants to be married to. It says only in the Lord, which means it should be a believer, okay? Somebody who's a believer in the family of the Lord, but it's not that you have to go through life like maybe one of these poems we're going, and you think, I have to find Mr. Right, and he's the only one meant for me. And so many times I hear people say, he's my soulmate, or she's my soulmate. And then they get divorced or something, <laughs> and they get another one, and they say the same thing, all right? And the reality is, is, is probably a lot of people could be functional with one another. Once you marry, you're not to be functional with anybody else, okay? When you're married tonight, that's supposed to be married to two people. You marry a person, you're functional with them. But here's the thing, is you can choose. And if you're waiting for that one perfect person, you might be like these people in the poems, and you're never going to meet the perfect person. Because I'll tell you what, every one of us has faults. Every one of us has troubles. Maybe you look for the person that has the least troubles, okay? You may look for that person. And you should also have love and respect and all those kind of good things together. One last thing about this psychology, I'll mention it because I did learn some interesting things, is we often marry people or, or link up with people who are very much on the same level as us, both in maturity, emotionalism, everything. So when we think later after we've been married, this person's all messed up, man, did I marry a messed up person, we have to be careful because psychology has proven, I can't prove this from the Bible, that more often than not, what attracts people to one another is they're on that same level, okay? They may be different in a lot of other ways, but they are on the same level of emotionalism, of, of intellect, of different things, and you can't try to put that on the other person because you were both at the same level when you got married. And likely you're still at the same level if you have troubles. In fact, this one theory called Bowen theory, it points out that if you want to help your marriage and you have constant tension going against each other and you both have good reasons and good rights to be upset with each other, one person has to differentiate and grow to the higher level. One person has to emotionally mature and stand up and then it won't take long until the other person meets them on the higher level and then things start to get a lot better and i thought it makes a lot of sense you know and it makes a lot of sense biblically because it says if you're devoted to the lord what gets better things get better i got a little book i don't know if i have many copies left if you want to look at it but it's called how to fight for your marriage without fighting one another and it says this guy was a pastor and for years he tried to fix all the problems of all the people who came to him give little remedies, like, you know, little doctor-type things to them. And in the end, he realized if he could just help them to come to the two greatest commandments in their marriage, everything would work out itself anyways. If they were both to love God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love their neighbor as themselves, all of the other issues going on would eventually 
fall away yeah. because they're putting God first and they're loving the other person more than they love themselves and they're going after that kind of path and eventually the trouble just kind of disappears. And I thought, what a wonderful book that is. It was written by some pastor down in Florida. But really, I think that's a, a good biblical way, right? And that's where we need to be, be going at. And here's something I wrote here too. God has already planned your destiny, all right? Whoever you marry, it's not saying that it wasn't destined for you to marry that person. It's just saying that who are you to think that you're able to control your own destiny, to pick all these kind of things. I'll tell you what, if I controlled my own destiny, I bet you I'd be in prison right now, right down the road, all right? I probably would be, because I'd make some messed up mistakes, and that's where I'd be. But I believe it's God that is controlling my destiny, leading my paths to right, and doing for me because he loves me and because he's got this grace for me that he's given me such great things, all right? I tell you, I know it sounds crazy, but I, I really believe it. If it wasn't for God, there would be hope. Even, even as far as those things are concerned, I very much believe in what they call common grace. Every single person living has common grace. doesn't matter if they're ever going to go to heaven or not. God loves them and has given them common grace. Common grace to breathe, to be able to eat, to be able to function, to be able to know things. We have God's common grace all over the place, all right? I tell you, God is in control. God is sovereign. And we can't think that we're going to change God's sovereignty and that we know better than Him. He'll lead us to the right person. And I bet you it'll be like a lot of things. When we get to heaven one day and we look back on things and we can see clearly because we're in heaven, we'll be like, oh, God, you led me right to this woman to marry her. Oh, God, you did this and you did that. I didn't even see it, your involvement in all these things. I thought it was all me. But it's going to be God that was right there. Okay? Amen. Last few verses. It says, but in my opinion, which remember, this is the opinion of an apostle, all right, who has the advice from God for us. She is happier if she remains as she is. And I think that I also have the Spirit of God. Okay? So he's telling us he's got the Spirit of God with it. And I love this quote from a guy named Gary. I forgot his name now, but he's a... He's a big pastor somewhere. But he said, what if marriage was not designed for happiness, but for holiness? And I tell you what, almost all married people who've been married for more than a few months, maybe even a few weeks, maybe even a few days, maybe, will already know that this is true, all right? Because oftentimes, our happiness doesn't stay because happiness is controlled by happenings. But while we're married and we're in those relationships together, it makes us holy. It makes us less selfish. It makes us less self-centered. It causes us to be more God-centered. If we're going to be able to make it through these things and stay there, it's going to start rubbing us off. It's like a while ago, Tim, when he preached one time, he had this video, and the video was up there of this guy standing there and a guy that was pretending to be God standing there. And he had a, a chisel and a hammer. And the guy came in, he started chiseling the guy. The guy's like, oh, don't do that. He's like, do you want me to help you or not help you? I'm going to chisel away the bad in you, and I'm going to help you out, all right? And eventually, the guy breaks down in tears, and he says, do whatever you will, Lord. Let me be more like you. You know, make me holy. Help me. But our natural reaction is usually to run away from that stuff or to avoid it. But sometimes the pain is gain, okay? Sometimes that pain is good for us. And I'll tell you what, in marriage... Some, there is definitely going to be pain. There's going to be trouble at times, but it's going to help you to be more holy in the end of it all, okay? As long as you're keeping God first and keeping Him at the center of it all. Amen. My last verse for my last slide says, Marriage is to be held in honor among all, and the marriage bed is to be undefiled. For fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. So what this is saying is when people are married, it's to be held in honor among all. We're not to look at people and say, oh boy, that poor guy's married. Oh, that's so sad for him. All right? That's a wonderful thing. God's the one that instituted marriage. Okay? It was God that gave Eve to Adam. It was God that said it's not good for this man to be alone. There's nothing wrong with marriage at all. Okay? And it's to be held in honor. All right? And... No, and nobody in that marriage should be doing anything with anybody else, okay? They're one together. And I always say this when I do my marriage ceremonies, is marriage is God's second greatest gift next to salvation. It really is. When God gives you something to marry, that's the second greatest gift you'll ever get besides salvation. Now, will everybody get that gift? No. Some people are going to stay single, all right? And this is where we as Americans have troubles at times because we are so freedom 
type style. I am myself. I served 20 years in the Army. I'm a big freedom fighter type of guy. But we're so freedom type way that we always think for fair, that fair means everybody gets the same thing. Fair means you get what God gives you, okay? It may not always be what God gives somebody else. It may not be best for you, okay? I told somebody the other day, I said, if I think if I had a big church and stepped into a big church, they would have fired me. Because they would have been, what the heck is this guy talking about? He can't preach the word of God that way. He's too rough. Or he's too too crass. He can't, he can't say these kind of things in church. And I would be like, I'm going to say whatever the word says. And then I'd be all upset and depressed and family would be, we'd be out of income and it would be really bad. But instead he let me plant a church and be with you guys and thankfully you guys come and listen to me and grow with me and let the word of God work on you and we're in a free environment that we can say whatever we want to say and we can look in the word of God and read it for what it says and not try to make it say anything different. Amen. And we can disagree with each other sometimes and still connect with one another and continue to grow with one another and help each other, okay? And that, that's, that's a beautiful thing right there. And uh, so marriage is God's second greatest gift next to salvation. And some get it, some don't get it. But that's okay. It says here, if God has gifted you with singleness, you should be all right. Now, if you know for sure that God has not gifted you with singleness, and you're burning desires to marry, well, I'm sure you'll get married one day. I don't know when it'll be, but I'm sure it'll come for you because God has wired you and made you that way. And my last slide for us to ask some questions of ourselves is, is it about God's will or your will? Okay, this is where we always have to do. Remember the Lord's Prayer? It says, Thy will be done. It's not about our will. Too many times we have that same sinful desire that Satan had, that Eve had, that we want to be like God. And we can't have that desire. We want it to be God's will. We want to humble ourselves underneath Him, recognizing that He's a good Father and will give us everything He's ever going to give us, and it'll be the best thing we've ever got. Is your marriage centered on Jesus? Okay, if it's not centered on Jesus today, it's a brand new day. You can center it today on Jesus. Make Jesus the center of your marriage. Is God more important to you than yourself and even your spouse? All right? Is God the most important thing? Because if He's not, I tell you what, you're going to have a lot of trouble at one point. A lot of trouble. Do you recognize that we should not be governed by our feelings, but by the Word of God? Okay, feelings change every single day. Feelings are going to change, okay? Maybe it'll be a hormonal imbalance. Maybe it'll be that the weather's gray. I tell you, the weather's about to get gray for a while here. I've been in a while, long time, all right? I want to see some joy still and stuff in you guys. I don't want to see you all go winterized on me, all right? All right? Who is your master? That's what we have to ask ourselves. We all serve some master, okay? None of us are able to just be our own master, and that's it. We all have a master. Is our master sin or is our master Christ, okay? If our master is Christ, yeah, we're still going to have a little sin at times and stuff, okay? Because God's working on us. He's chipping us away and we won't be perfected until we go into glory one day. But who is our master? And that's a question we should ask ourselves continually. And I, and we should also be like that guy that prayed. I tell you, that, that little Bible verse, Jesus just met the guy in the way. And Jesus said, if you believe, all things are possible. And he said, Lord... Help my unbelief. I tell you, that's a verse that's integrated into my spiritual ethos very strictly. Is Lord, help my unbelief. When I have troubles, Lord, help me. Help my unbelief. Help me to stay focused on you. And I wrote here, last of all, Jesus is either your Lord of all or not your Lord at all. And time will tell. I don't believe anybody is going to be perfect. Like I said, we got 1 John 1, 8 out there. Okay? But there is a difference between somebody who's growing in God and somebody who doesn't ever have any growth and any fruit whatsoever at all. And it's time to tell us this, okay? And we can't tell this. We can't point at this person and say they were saved and they weren't saved. We can say maybe it's likely or unlikely, but it's only God, you know? And it's between that person and Jesus Christ. And Jesus died for every single person who would believe on Him. Amen. And if you can believe on Jesus today, Jesus died for you, okay? Because he did that, and what he did on the cross, he paid that price in full. All right, I said it the other day. I don't know when it was. Maybe just yesterday, it seems like. I've been talking to a lot of folks lately. It was. I was in here teaching the class yesterday, and I started preaching the gospel while I'm teaching the class. It wasn't about a gospel class, but I did. And I said to some folks that weren't believers, at least I don't think they were believers, 
I said, you know what? I said, you don't have to try to get right with God. You don't have to try to do a bunch of things. You don't have to try to be a good person. You don't have to be something that you're not. You need to come to Jesus just as you are and submit to him today. And he will lead you and your life will change. And that's the way to go. And I had some older folks who I think were church folks too look at me like, who is he to say such a thing as that? Like, I've done all these things in my life. And how could he say that? And I'm thinking... You're just like the Pharisee. You missed it all, and you're not on the path yourself. And here's this, some other young folks who are maybe in all kinds of trouble, but they got an open mind, and they're searching for things, and they're searching for God. And as I shared it with them, there was a connection. Man, I could feel a connection. Like They were like, wow, nobody's ever put it like that. Nobody's ever mentioned it, that it's not something I have to do. It's something that God's already done, Amen. and I just have to search after him and believe in him and just go the way I am today, and he takes care of the rest. And the other people were looking at me like, who is this heretic on the roof of his church? I don't know. That's what I was thinking in my mind. Maybe my mind was all messed up, you know. But after you talk to people a lot, you can sometimes tell what some people are thinking about you and what other people are, at least when you're witnessing. And that's what I saw going on. And I, I pray to the Lord that maybe it bothers the other people and they'll think about it. And, and they'll ask their pastor or somebody and say, you know, how do I get to heaven? And hopefully they'll say by Christ alone, by grace, because he already paid all the price for you. It's not something that you're going to go do. It's something that he did for you. You just need to believe. Amen. So with that, we'll go ahead and close. And bow your heads, please. Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for this day. I thank you for every person that's here today, Lord. Lord, I thank you that you gave them patience and strength and the mind to be able to stay with me through this sermon, to be able to listen. And Lord, I ask you that you let your words sink into their lives, sink into their spirits, Lord. And Lord, it would do the work that you would have it to do, Lord. Lord, I know that there is a one meaning, but thousands of different applications to every scripture, Lord. And Lord, I ask you, Lord, that your word would go on out and done a great work in each person here today. That you'll change us, that you'll help us all to be more devoted to you. To be another little step along the way of this great Great path of life, Lord, and in the direction of you, Lord Jesus. Lord, I ask you that you'd have mercy on us and you have grace upon us. Lord, we thank you so much as we get ready to have this Thanksgiving meal, Lord, to give thanks. We thank you for this year that you've given us. You think We thank you for the lives that you've given us. We thank you for the opportunity you gave us. And we thank you for everything, Lord Jesus. We thank you for, for the...